Hey there, Braves. So I wanted to quickly go over some of the finer details of meiosis with you guys. Um, and really what I'm mainly focused on are two processes that occur in meiosis one. So if you call, there are two parts to meiosis. There is meiosis one, which is prophase one through telophase one. And that basically ends up with two uh, cells at the end that are technically haploid. And I, I might get into some of the details about that in a minute. And then the second part is meiosis two, and that is where those two cells become four, and you get four cells at the end that each have half a copy of DNA, which is 23 chromosomes. And this is how your sex cells, uh, your egg and your sperm cells, or if you're a plant, your pollen and your egg cells are created. Now, um, this is very different from, I mean, it's similar to, but it's different than mitosis. Meiosis obviously is two stages of division. You end up with four cells instead of two. Instead of having a full copy at the end, you have half a copy. Um, and on top of that, the copies that you have at the end are highly variable. And what I mean by that is that um, at the end of mitosis, you have two identical copies. These are clones of each other. They are identical in every possible way. However, each one of the gametes, the sex cells that are created from meiosis, may have a little bit of the mother DNA and a whole lot of the father DNA, or a whole lot of the father DNA and a little bit of the mother's DNA, or so on and so forth. Because inside of you right now, every single person watching this, you have a little bit of DNA from your mom and a little bit of DNA from your dad. And collectively, that's what makes you. Well, those are the genes that you have to make your sex cells with, sperm or egg. So you are going to get a random, um, and it's pretty random, you're gonna get a random mix of the genes that you inherited from your parents into your sex cells as opposed to exact copies of everything that you have right now which is what happens in mitosis and that variation how we get that variation is actually the point of what i want to talk to you about today where does this variation come from why aren't we getting a bunch of identical copies in our sex cells wouldn't it just make sense to just recopy yourself and send it along its way so um that's kind of what i want to talk about today so to start off with, we get into independent assortment. Now this occurs in between metaphase and anaphase. It's the part where you actually start to separate the homologous pairs on either side of the, um, of the cells, the two eventual cells. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw my cell here. And what I'm gonna do is in red, that's gonna be um, the, the, the paternal. P-A-T, paternal um, chromosomes. And the blue will be the maternal, which is the coming from the mother. So paternal are the chromosomes that you got from your dad. Maternal are the chromosomes, the DNA you got from your mom. All right, so red is dad, blue is mom. Just keep that in mind. All right, so um, as I'm doing this, here's the first set of red chromosomes coming across, and this would be 24, 23 from your dad and 23 from your mom, but I'm not going to draw all that. Um, and remember, in, in interphase, before we start meiosis, you double those. So here's the doubling. Now you have a homologous pair. Boink, boink, just like that. And don't forget that in the middle, you have your centromere tying them together. And don't forget, if you remember your amoeba sister video that you watched today, we count the number of chromosomes based on the centromeres. So go back and watch that and the whole number thing and you, you can learn about that there. All right, and then we've got our mom's chromosomes. And just like with the dad's stuff and in interphase, this was doubled. So we have two full copies of DNA here. Um, to start with, so we are diploid. We are two, oops, we are two in or diploid 
at this point. Okay, independent assortment is basically the fact that these are not going to segregate themselves up the middle on mom's DNA over here and dad's DNA over here like I have in the picture. It's randomly um, assorted. So what do I mean by that? Well, instead of this one right here and this one right here being mom and dad, sometimes they'll line up like that. So maybe this group of genes right here, code for eye color, hair color, and height. So instead of having mom's uh, chromosomes on the left side here, on left, for those of you who don't know, and right. So instead of having all of moms on the left and all of dads on the right, you actually will get moms, um, say, a foot shape and uh, liver function over here, but then you'll get dad's eye and height over here and so on and so forth. So how they mix together um, in either of the separations uh, differs. Now, because of this, because these can be on either side and mixed together in any assortment, you have up to 8 million possible combinations um, for the separation of these genes. So that's, that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big number of potential crosses so, or combinations. So that right there already introduces quite a bit of variation into what the um, sex cells are going to be, just simply by randomly assorting um, these in the middle during uh, metaphase and anaphase. Okay, now, if all we did was this, if all we did was the independent assortment, and your sex cells were created only through the independent assortment, and you were to cross your sex cells with a person of the opposite sex's sex cells, you could have up to 64 billion possible combinations. That's just with independent assortment alone and fertilization fertilizations when the sperm and egg come together, right? So that is a huge amount of variation within our species. Now, we add another layer of variation or complexity with the other step, which is crossing over. Now, with crossing over, there's my cell again. Here's dad's DNA. And here's mom's DNA, there are chromosomes here. This only occurs in meiosis one. And this happens between prophase and metaphase um, as they start to align uh, up at the middle. So what happens here is that when these two things get close to each other, point point so they, they they start to line up towards the middle the um, chromatids which remember this is a chromatid that's a chromatid this is a chromatid and that's a chromatid right and they're joined together by the centromere in the middle okay so we got that got that everyone in the room everyone watching that's got that okay so what can happen is that those chromatids can cross with the other ones so what you'll get so I back all of this up is the dad, his DNA will go here. Mom's chromosomes will go here. And you see they cross. They actually kind of touch each other there. When they do that, they can switch genes from one chromatid to another. So what will happen, and I'll just draw an arrow to point out that I'm going to the next step here, is that you can end up with chromosomes that look like this and whoop, 
like that. So now, not only can you independently, um, you know, assort these, sort these out, but you can also mix some of the genes from one chromatid to another and, and switch them so that this um, homologous set of chromosomes here has a blend of dad's DNA and mom's DNA in those chromatids. That ups the complexity drastically. And what this means, essentially, is that you can have 72 trillion, with a T, 72 trillion different possible combinations of your genes with your mate's genes. That's how much complexity and variance this brings in to the gene pool. Now, things to mention about this. It doesn't have to be an entire chromatid down here that switches. It can just be um, single genes or a handful of genes. So that level of variation of how much genetic information is switched from one set of chromosomes to the other, um, it varies as well. So that's why that number gets so big. So in reality, what these look like when they are on the other, when they start to separate out into other cells, um, looks something more like this, where it's mostly, say, mom's uh, chromosome with a lot of dad's information kind of interspersed or intermixed in. So this is why your siblings may look similar to you. You may look similar to your mom or dad, but you don't look identical because the likelihood of getting an identical copy of anything um, is basically zero. Um, I'm 71 and 72 trillion, 368 billion, 744 million, 177,664 to one that it will not happen. Meaning your brother and your sister are basically will never in any way, shape or form be identical unless they're identical twins, which split from the same fertilized cell. Okay. So, um, other things to think about with this, the, uh, obviously this means that no human is exactly alike, but other things to think about is that, you know, when sperm cells are released or pollen cells are released, they're released by the hundreds of thousands or millions. And there's all of these different, slightly different versions of, um, well, a potential human or a potential flower or plant. And whichever one of those wins out at the end to fertilize the egg cell, um, that's basically completely random. So if, say, your parents were to have waited five minutes before um, creating you, you might not exist. It's that simple. You would be a completely different person if they waited just five minutes more or 10 seconds more or a day or a year, you wouldn't exist at all because that's how many different possible combinations um, that can be had and the likelihood of the one that exactly made you um, happening twice is virtually impossible. So um, anyways, that is crossing over and that is independent assortment and that's how it basically works. Now from here, um, you know, these will split one more time and you will end up with what you see down here where you have some cells that have a lot of dad's dna with some of mom's mixed in and vice versa sometimes it's half and half like whatever the the general mix of stuff versus what happens in mitosis which is exact copies and one thing i forgot to mention in the original recording of this video is why it's haploid and diploid and um why at the end of meiosis one we call it haploid instead of diploid, even though we technically have um, those those copies of uh, DNA at the end um, in each one. Because if you look, when by the time you get to the end of mitosis, you have two cells and they're each two in. They each have a full copy of DNA. But when we look at what happens here at the end of meiosis one, we have two cells here 
which are considered haploid. But when you count up the number of chromosomes, you're like, well, wait a second. Um, it looks like they have a full copy. The thing is, is that they don't actually. So first and foremost, if you go back and, and rewatch the mitosis versus meiosis amoeba sister side by side video that you were supposed to watch before this one, um, she goes into how we actually count the number of chromosomes. And that has to do with the number of centromeres that we count. And in this instance, we, you know, count 23, which is um, not a full copy. The other reason is because in mitosis, you have a full set of your mother's genes and a full set of your father's genes. And in at the end of meiosis, that might not happen due to independent assortment. So um, with independent assortment, what ends up happening is that instead of having one of each of the chromosomes from each parent, one cell might have two chromosomes from one parent and zero of the other, and the other one might have the opposite. So if we're sticking with the red and blue, red being the paternal and the blue being the maternal stuff, this cell right here has a, a double copy of the maternal set of genes for say height and eye color and hair color. But over here on this one, this one has two paternal um, copies of that. So this cell won't have the mom's information for height and eye color and hair color. And this one will have moms, but not dads. So you can't say they have a full copy of DNA. Um, of, of the chromosomes. The, and, and so there's, there's, that's two reasons why, uh, essentially, we call this haploid. Um, and hopefully that kind of clarifies it because that's one of those things that when I was a student, um, and even up until very recently, I had a hard time wrapping my head around. Um, so hopefully that helps you out there. All right, that's all I'll say about this topic. So what is the point of talking about meiosis? Well, meiosis is why we are so genetically diverse as a species and why all sexually uh, reproducing creatures are as genetically diverse as they are. It's what's allowed us to adapt and evolve over time. Without this process, we just keep creating clones of each other and we really don't have the opportunity to adapt to new environments or do so um, in, in a efficient manner. So variability is important to our survival. And to explain what I mean by that, just think about how differently COVID-19 has impacted different people of different age groups, of different nationalities, of just across the board, humans are different. And you've seen where, for the most part, people my age or younger we're barely impacted by COVID. It, it might just be like a bad flu for some of us. And some of us, we don't even notice we have it. We're asymptomatic, right? But every so often there'll be someone our age who just drops dead of it. They, they have the worst possible case. They have to go to the, the hospital. They get intubated and they end up passing away as a result of the disease. Well, that's due to genetic variation. Um, the same thing is true for all of the medicines that you take. There are virtually zero medicines on the market that won't at least kill some small percentage of people who take them for the first time. Even Advil or aspirin or your, your very common over-the-counter drugs, well, they have like something like a one in one million chance of you being the person that that particular medicine interacts negatively with and you have a severe reaction or possibly die from it. So it, um, our genetic variability makes it very difficult from a um, medicinal standpoint to understand completely what's going on with each individual patient, how any one medicine might impact a population, um, how one vaccine might impact a population. We're starting to see um, some of the information or numbers come out from the phase three and phase four trials of how these Moderna and Pfizer vaccines and the AstraZeneca vaccine. The reason we go through these tests um, with all of these numbers of people um, in these trials 
is because of our genetic variability, we have to get as big of a sample size with as many different types of people in it as possible to ensure whatever we're putting out into the public is going to be safe because of that genetic variability. So um, that's a good thing because if a disease comes around that wipes out a huge portion of the population, there's a good chance that there's another small percent of the population that won't be affected by it as badly and will survive and continue on the species. If we were all genetic copies and COVID happened to be deadly, well, that would be the end of the human race. So thank goodness for that variability. Now, things to mention though, is that this is what makes it so hard to predict what your children are gonna look like and how they're gonna turn out um, from a genetically, or, you know, strictly speaking on, on a, from genetics. Now, in the future, we are going to be able to adjust the genomes, specifically the exact genes we wanna change in our children before we have them. And there is a technology that is out now that we're using in plants and animals, and we're starting to look into human studies where we basically take a virus that will infect all of your cells and it will insert the genes we want in the exact place we want them to insert those genes. And this technology is called CRISPR. And right now it's illegal to test in humans. Um, one scientist in China broke international law and actually tried to use this in a set of twins. Um, the twins so far, from my knowledge, are okay, but the entire scientific community freaked out about it because it's a big no-no. Um, and some adults, some biohackers, have actually tried to use the CRISPR technique to change their genes. And both of those individuals ended up dying as a result. So this isn't something that's here now for humans, but the way technology is developing, um, it could be here by the end of the next decade or two decades from now. And if you wait to have children as long as I waited to have children and you get into your 30s, well, it, this might be a viable option. Um, it might be right at the bleeding edge, but this might be a viable option by the time you're ready to have kids. Maybe you can select the genes so your kid um, has the best chance of being the smartest possible kid that you and your potential mate could create or the, the tallest or the uh, strongest or maybe a combination of all of your best characteristics and all of your mate's best characteristics put together. What's the best possible choice you could create? Well, that's where we're heading as a species, as a technological species. So um, understanding meiosis and how all of this works is going to better inform you of some of the things that we have coming down the pike uh, in the very near future. At the very least, you as a voter are going to need to understand this technology so that you can make an informed vote um, on the public policy regarding it. Um, you know, stem cell research was held back almost a decade due to um, American, uh, you know, federal government policies. Now, I'm not making a statement one way or another on those, but understanding the science behind, say, stem cell research would have been very beneficial for our politicians, you know, before they put the moratorium on that blocking stem cell research. We might be a whole decade ahead of where we are with stem cells had we not have done that. So um, understanding this technology as it comes to the forefront of human development and, and, and biological health is important for all of us. If you're going to vote as a citizen, if you're going to have children in the future, you want to understand this. So um, anyways, we are going to have a project exactly on this and the moral implications of it next week. You're going to have a video about it, but that's for next week. So um, until then, I will leave you to sit here and think about all of the implications of CRISPR and meiosis. And um, yeah, I'll catch you guys later.